Dinosaurs, mammoths and Neanderthals are some of the celebrities in the history book of evolution. They used to thrive on our planet, but they all became extinct. And they're not the only ones. More than 99.9% .9 of all species that have inhabited the Earth are no longer with us. Our own species has only recently made its appearance on the evolutionary stage. Our large brain made it possible for us to colonize even the most remote corners of the world and to grow to a population of more than 7 billion individuals. Some scientists argue that it has made us all but immune from extinction. Others say we are in even greater peril than ever before. We're entering a, a period when the level of risk is much greater than ever before. There is a significant probability that we will fail permanently and end the human history in this century. We are doing things and are going to do things in this century that have never been done before. We are going to develop extremely powerful technologies that will enable us to manipulate and reconstruct the nature of life and get control of matter on the atomic and molecular level. No one knows if humanity is at the beginning of its journey or approaching the end. It didn't take long for popular culture to develop a special genre around this subject. Now even scientists are taking an interest in the disasters which could bring about the end for our species. For most of human history there really wasn't that much we could do about existential risks. But now we've reached a point where through our science we are able to understand some of the things that could threaten our existence. Are we mainly threatened by natural phenomena? Or will we bring about the end all by ourselves? And what are the odds that an extinction level event will occur this century? We'll be seeking answers to those questions The closest star, the Sun, is a prerequisite for life on Earth. Without it, there would be no plants, animals or humans. But the powerful physical processes which occur inside stars can also extinguish life. When a star dies in a violent fashion, we may be unlucky enough to be directly in its path. Believe it or not, we are literally looking down the gun barrel of the most titanic explosive event in the entire universe. On March 19th, 2008, instruments recorded a very distant stellar phenomenon that is unparalleled in the history of astronomy. The final phase during the life of a giant star. A supernova, powerful enough to produce a so-called gamma-ray burst. So here is a massive star. It collapses to form a black hole. And along the axis of rotation, energetic charged particles can go flying out at nearly the speed of light. They burst through the surface of the star, produce two oppositely directed jets, a gamma-ray burst. If a gamma-ray burst were to occur in our neighborhood, the consequences for us would be catastrophic. If that beam were to hit the Earth, first of all, it would wipe out our ozone layer so that harmful radiation would go right to the surface of the Earth and life itself would be endangered. One of at least five extinction-level events occurred on our planet 450 million years ago. More than 50% of all animal life on Earth was wiped out. According to one theory, a gamma-ray burst may have contributed to the disaster with its harmful cosmic radiation. If a gamma-ray burst devastated the Earth 450 million years ago, it may happen again. 
and scientists have discovered a star that is approaching the very end of its life and that may produce an enormous gamma ray burst at any time. This is WR104. Compared to the star that produced a gamma ray burst in 2008, it is practically next door to us. And astronomers now know that its rotational axis is aligned within a few degrees of Earth. If WR104 were to send a gamma ray burst towards us, it would have dire consequences for our planet. By the time the radiation is here, it's going to be very much attenuated. But it'll be sufficient to cause disruptions in the upper atmosphere, and enough to wipe out the ozone layer at the minimum. We would be subjected to dangerous levels of ultraviolet radiation, and the buildup of nitrogen compounds would result in acid rain. Crops would wither, the food chain would gradually collapse, life in the oceans would be extinguished, and so with the food chain of the Earth paralyzed, it means all life in the Earth will begin to crumble. But a gamma ray burst isn't the only threat we would be facing from a collapsing star. What is left after the explosion, a black hole, could cause even bigger problems. A black hole is the most monstrous, the most fantastic object in the entire universe. Because everything that tries to come out goes right back into the black hole. Scientists have long known about the large black holes that form the central hubs in spiral galaxies. Our own solar system orbits a black hole in a stable orbit at a safe distance of 27,000 light years. But the black hole that was discovered 10 years ago came as a shock to the scientific community. In 2001, we were looking at the night sky and something was passing in front of the stars. Starlight was distorted. Something was moving in front of the stars that was invisible. We tracked it and we find, oh my God, it's a wandering black hole. Black holes are not stationary. They actually can wander throughout the galaxy. And we began to realize there's a new threat. Wandering black holes that are totally unpredictable. Scientists now believe that there are thousands of wandering black holes in our galaxy. These leftover remnants of supernovas have been hurled out in every direction throughout the Milky Way. They can collide with other black holes to be flung out in different directions. So that's what we think happened here. It was probably a collision of some sort that then drove this black hole into an orbit around the Milky Way galaxy. If a black hole were to pass through our solar system, we would be in immediate danger. If a black hole starts to get close to our solar system, we would know that the outer planets, their orbits are distorted. They begin to wobble. Once the black hole passes by Saturn, it would start to affect the Earth's orbit. It would push the Earth towards the Sun, or push us out into space. And it might devour us completely. But for that to occur, the cosmic vacuum cleaner would have to come within a measly few hundred kilometers of Earth. The odds of being hit by a gamma ray burst this century are minimal, about 1 in 10 million. The odds of a close encounter with a black hole are even slimmer. This is one of the risks from nature. We know something about them, which is that they are very rare. It would be extremely unlikely if one of these um, uh, blasts hit us within the next 100 years. That's why the threats from collapsing stars end up in the 10th and final spot on our list of annihilation scenarios. The next threat on our list is a lot more likely to occur. No one noticed as it came hurling towards us a few years ago and no instruments caught it as it passed us by at a distance less than a third of the way to the moon. It wasn't until three days after the close miss that the large asteroid, 2002 MN, 
was discovered. If its orbit had been just slightly different, it would have hit Earth with enough force to wipe out a city like, for example, Stockholm. There would have been no warning, and the results would have been devastating. End. Fini. Everybody in Stockholm is dead. We live in the middle of a shooting gallery. There are things whizzing by all the time that we are totally oblivious about. At night, if you could somehow illuminate all the objects that are drifting by the Earth, you'd be shocked. From a humble cubicle in an ordinary office landscape, millions of cosmic projectiles are being watched. Here's, here's my office here. Th this is a, uh, a diagram of where some of the potentially hazardous asteroids are right now. If we plot the orbits of these asteroids, now you can see that we have a lot to worry about. Paul Chodas's morning routine would make anyone wish they'd stayed in bed. Automated software allows for information regarding newly discovered asteroids which may impact Earth to be sent directly to his inbox. So we have, for example, a, a new object was discovered which has a possibility of an Earth impact in the year 2071 with a probability of uh, about three in a million. This is a new discovery overnight. <laughs> Every day we have something new. But an object the size of a high-rise building, like 2002 MN, would impact Earth without warning is unfortunately not an unlikely scenario. Half of the asteroids approaching us have the sun on their backs and are therefore impossible to detect in advance. And there are plenty of objects left to discover out there. Of the ones which cross the Earth's orbit and pose a potential threat to Earth, there are about one million of them. And of those, today, we only know about one percent or less. In fact, a fraction of one percent. The most serious known asteroid threat right now comes from Apophis. It's a mid-sized asteroid with a diameter of 270 meters. It weighs 20 million tons and could eradicate not only Stockholm, but all of Northern Europe, as it would release enough energy to match 65,000 Hiroshima bombs. Make a note in your calendar for Friday, April the 13th, 2029. That's when Apophis will pass by Earth at an altitude of only 29,000 kilometers, lower than some man-made satellites. There are several possible ways of deflecting an incoming asteroid. Given plenty of warning, the best course of action would be to use a so-called asteroid tugboat. You hover in front of it like a helicopter, okay, and you're pulling it toward you using gravity. You never touch it. If you want to slow it down, you hover behind it. And you stay the same, you stay close to it, but behind it, and you're slowing it down. And you either speed it up or slow it down to deflect it whichever direction you want it to go. Rusty Schweikert used to be an astronaut in NASA's Apollo program. He now spends his time trying to bring about a global strategy to deal with the threat from above. You may think, in Sweden, that the European Space Agency or NASA in the United States has a responsibility to protect the Earth from asteroid impacts. You're wrong. We have not made the necessary testing and we haven't even done the analytic job that we should because nobody has responsibility. But an asteroid the size of Apophis would not endanger humanity as a whole. They're going to wipe out a city or a region or a state or something of that kind. But when they get up to two kilometers or so in diameter, now you're talking about a global disaster. Astronomers have discovered more than 800 asteroids close to Earth, which are more than a kilometer in size. Once you reach three kilometers in diameter, it really becomes a very serious global event where there is a possibility that, that humanity could succumb 
If you go up to 10 kilometers, then it might be more likely than not that humanity would die. The asteroid that wiped out 75% of all life on Earth 65 million years ago, including the dinosaurs, was about 10 kilometers in size. The explosion set the stage for small mammals from which we humans would later evolve. But we can't know if we would be among the minority of species which would survive the next huge impact. You would have, obviously, an immense shock during the actual impact, but with a large asteroid strike, it could inject a lot of uh, soot and aerosols into the atmosphere, which would block out the sunlight, and you could get a long period of uh, darkness and uh, below freezing temperatures uh, around the globe. And, and it's probably through these climatic uh, effects in the aftermath that the last human survivors would perish. Well, there's a good one today, JU-39. Okay. Check it out. In all probability, none of the larger asteroids will be on a collision course with Earth in the immediate future. The real threat to humanity comes from another direction. The real danger is not asteroids so much, because we track them. They go around the sun in very periodic orbits. The danger is comets. The bad news is that they travel at twice the speed, and that they can be enormous. They could be as big as Pluto. We now realize that Pluto itself is not really a planet. It's a comet, an overgrown comet. And beyond Pluto, we think there are other objects just as big as Pluto. But the really bad news is that most comets, even the large ones, are completely impossible to spot. In a worst case scenario, a comet makes a first pass around the sun, so there's no tail. We don't see it at all. It is totally invisible. As it goes around the sun, we see this gigantic tail coming out with a comet at the front, and we have two weeks warning, and all we can do is cross our fingers and hope that it misses us. An asteroid with a diameter of three kilometers could potentially wipe out humanity. But the odds of one of these heading right for us this century are slim. And so the threat from space projectiles ends up as number nine on our doomsday list. The next threat on our list is twice as likely to occur. When the Earth's interior awakes, it's best to stay clear. Uh, volcanic eruptions are the, the most extreme kind of event that could happen on the Earth today. The most dangerous volcanoes are so huge that people don't even realize they're standing on one. Many of the visitors don't realize they're vacationing in one of the world's largest active volcanoes. When the Earth's largest volcanoes awake, every single life form on the planet is at risk. Supervolcano eruption might be the one type of catastrophe that in our past has come closest to causing human extinction. <laughs> Times were hard for the people who inhabited the Earth 75,000 years ago. One of the Earth's recurring cold periods had begun. The temperature was dropping, and things were about to take a turn for the worse. On the other side of the world, on the island of Sumatra, an enormous volcanic eruption occurred. The volcano called Toba pumped out several thousand cubic kilometers of magma and sulfurous gas into the atmosphere. Our ancestors in East Africa would have seen the sky growing darker. You would have seen the sun much, much dimmer. The sky would be almost overcast. Global temperatures dropped 
It would have been a freezing temperatures at the equator. Scientists believe that the volcanic winter caused by Toba's eruption lasted more than five years and that it almost led to a total disaster for humanity. We know that uh, from modern genetic studies of human beings that we went through a, a population narrowing about 75,000 years ago, about the time when the Toba eruption happened. We reduced the numbers to maybe uh, a few thousand individuals. It's been described as humanity's most critical hour. Really, the human species then was teetering on the brink of extinction. So according to the Toba catastrophe theory, this immense supervolcano was responsible uh, for virtually, almost, causing the extinction of the human species. And eruptions of this magnitude are not just things of the past. For volcanoes, especially supervolcanoes, it's not a question of if it's, there's going to be another eruption. It's just a question of when the eruption will be. The main candidate for the next super eruption is actually also one of the world's most visited tourist spots. Three million tourists visit Yellowstone each year to enjoy the scenery and the wildlife. But many people don't know that they're standing on the lid of one of the world's largest active volcanoes. Most people, when they think of volcanoes, they think of something blowing up and then it ejects material to the sides and it tends to form a steep uh, sided conical hill. A caldera is where so much material is ejected you know, a thousand cubic kilometers, such that the ground subsides into a large depression. Yellowstone's caldera is enormous, 40 kilometers wide and 80 kilometers long. And two kilometers down is a gigantic magma chamber, pushing up from below like an enormous pressure cooker that will explode at some point in the future. Will there be future eruptions in Yellowstone? Definitely. There is no doubt about that. Now, do we have earthquake swarms? Absolutely. Do we have ground deformation? Absolutely. Why is that not indicating a potential eruption? Because they're all in different areas. So they're not caused by this movement of molten rock in one area. Yellowstone is a supervolcano which, historically, has awoken with eerie regularity. It has a cycle of super eruptions which is fairly regular, uh, about once every 600,000 years. The last one was a little more than 600,000 years ago. So you might say, in a sense, uh, according to the past behavior of the volcano, that we're overdue for a volcanic eruption. When it's time for Yellowstone to erupt, cracks in the ground will open up and lava will be spewed out. First in one spot, then in several. Eventually, a ring of cracks will cause the lid to collapse and the magma chamber will explode upwards. An enormous cloud of grey gas will be formed as the volcano erupts. This is called a pyroclastic flow and it consists of superheated steam. It spreads in all directions, travelling at several hundred kilometres per hour. Nothing in its path can survive. This is Bozeman, the fastest growing city in Montana and a natural starting point for a visit to Yellowstone. It's a hundred kilometers away, but it will be eradicated by the pyroclastic flow. Smaller particles in the doomsday cloud will reach an altitude of 25,000 meters and spread across the entire atmosphere. 
The main effect of super eruptions on society would be the climatic effects. In the worst case scenario, you would have maybe up to five or six years in which the growing season would be cut short or probably maybe even eliminated completely. For now, we don't have any of the kind of stockpiles of food uh, that we would need to get through a volcanic situation. An incoming asteroid might be deflected, and diplomacy can avert a full-scale nuclear war. But there's no stopping a supervolcano. The odds of a supervolcano erupting in our lifetime are slim, maybe just 0.1 or 0.2 percent. And hopefully, enough of us will survive to restart civilization. But historically, Supervolcanic eruptions have occurred more than twice as often as large asteroid or comet impacts. And so the threat from volcanoes ranks higher than that from space projectiles, at number eight on our list. The next item on our list is in the category of unknown threats. It was recorded just before midnight, one night in August 1977. A signal that caused the instruments at Ohio State University's radio telescope to spike. The signal came from a spot in the sky just east of the star constellation known as Sagittarius, 220 light years away. The signal was so clear that the operator made what has become a famous notation on the computer printout. What made the wow signal interesting is that the signal shape, the way the signal went up and down with time, perfectly mimicked the kind of shape you would expect from a signal coming from one spot on the sky, moving with the stars. During the search for extraterrestrial intelligent life, the WOW signal is the only signal that cannot be explained as a natural cosmic phenomenon, or the result of human activity. In the case of the WOW signal, of course, we don't know what it was. It was never seen again. Could they be out there? Advanced creatures that have been portrayed in books and movies? At times they've come in peace, but for the most part, their plans have been much more sinister. All right, here we go. This is our first exposure of the night. Go, we're shooting. No one knows if there is life on other planets. But given the rapid advances being made in astronomy, it's most likely to be only a matter of time before we know the answer. Well, we are living in a very special time. And now, finally, for the first time in human history, we have a chance to find the first Earth-like planets orbiting other stars and find some of those Earth-like planets that are habitable, suitable for life as we know it. Since the first discovery was made in 1995, planet hunters on both sides of the Atlantic have come up with an inventory of about 500 so-called exoplanets planets which orbit around other stars. So you saw that from, from, from the first detection 15 years ago when we were basically detecting only if there is a planet and what about is a planet, no, we move very far along the way that we start to tell you what is the temperature on the planet, what is the size on the planet, what is the gravity, uh, is it rocky, is it, is it gas, could you land on this planet, basically. So we're really moving it's like a science fiction book, but it's not science fiction, it's reality. <laughs> this is the first star that was found to have planets which could sustain life. Gliese is a solar system just 20 light years away, and like our solar system, it contains several planets. Both the planet called 581G and possibly its outer neighbor, 581D, may be able to sustain life. Since Earth-like planets have been found in such close proximity to us, after such a short search, 
Scientists believe that the number of Earth-like planets in space could be enormous. So there are so many stars in the galaxy. There are 100 billion stars. So I must expect to have millions of planets with life. But whether or not the galaxy is abundant with intelligent life is a completely different question. You see this very obvious line here. That's a signal. And that's the kind of thing we're looking for. Because at SETI, at the time, search for extraterrestrial intelligence, like people believe that it's only a matter of time before we establish contact. Keep in mind that there are just an awful lot of worlds out there. Maybe one percent of them are interesting, or one in a hundred of a percent of them are interesting. When you have a million million of them, it really doesn't matter. People have been listening for extraterrestrial signals for almost 50 years now. But so far, nothing more promising than the wow signal has been picked up. But that'll change. I think that'll change. This array will allow us to search enormously faster. And so with this thing going, you know, in the next two dozen years, you could check out a million star systems. That's the antenna that I think could find ET in the next two dozen years. But then, could aliens pose a threat? No one has a problem with just listening for signals, like at SETI. But what this man does has caused some raised eyebrows. Alexander Zaitsev is a Russian radio astronomer. No one has done more to send messages into space than him. His latest message was transmitted in 2008 to the Gliese solar system. We make our part of job. If there are beings in the Gliese system that are able to receive his message when it arrives in the spring of 2028, they would find out quite a lot about us. The message includes a list of Earth's natural resources, such as minerals and metals. A map shows how the continents are aligned. And included is also a guide to the genetic makeup of humans. There are conferences that have been organized by the, about this. The reason that uh, we consider them is because it's, it's a highly emotional subject. And it's an emotional subject because there are some people who think it's dangerous and they don't think that anybody should do it. And some people will object to say, yeah, yeah, sure, there's all this, you know, our television and so forth has been going into space, but that's a pretty weak signal. What we should try to avoid is any deliberate broadcast that would make a very much stronger signal going in the direction of some particular star system. Alexander Zaitsev shrugs off the criticism. Ours might be the only civilization in our part of the universe. If so, we could scratch aliens off the list of threats. But if intelligent beings are a common occurrence, it could very well be that violence and aggressive behavior is a characteristic of aliens, just as it is with us. Then we could be in trouble. If you look at the history of humanity, every time a more technically advanced society met a less technically advanced society, it didn't work out so well for the less technically advanced. If aliens wanted to get rid of us, they would most likely be able to accomplish just that. Well, the chances that they're only 50 or 100 years or 500 years more advanced than us, just statistically, that's not very likely. It's much more likely that they're thousands or millions of years more advanced than we are. Looking down on Earth at night would make it clear where to launch an attack, if an aggressor should wish to maximize the effects.
Since we most likely wouldn't survive an encounter with aggressive aliens, this threat ranks as number seven on our doomsday list. The next threat on our list is anything but unknown to us. In many ways, these are the most successful entities on Earth. Bacteria, parasites and viruses. Every single animal or plant has its own virus strains. The host animal can often coexist peacefully with its inner companions, but not always. Among the global catastrophic risks, natural pandemics is up at or very near the top. They have killed us in large numbers throughout history, and they will do so again. Now, with global travel, a pandemic uh, could spread very quickly to all parts of the globe. So our past track record of surviving these events cannot give us a 100% guarantee that these will not occur and be universally deadly in the future. The year is 1918. People all over the world celebrate the end of World War I, like here on Market Street in San Francisco. A four-year-long war is finally over. But as the war is ending, the real enemy appears. A lot more deadly than artillery shells or poison gas. Looking closely at the celebration, you notice that people are wearing face masks. An influenza pandemic called the Spanish flu is spreading like wildfire. Almost half of the world's population is infected, and around 80 million people die. You will, you will find any cemetery in Britain, uh, you will find uh, 1918 deaths. The final toll with the flu pandemic globally was much more than the toll from the First World War. Much, much more. Why the 1918 flu pandemic came to be so devastating is still not fully understood. Oh, heavens, it's the biggest, in a sense, the biggest unsolved mystery of the 20th century. How could 18 billion people suddenly vanish? John Oxford believes that the almost century-old virus can teach us something about how to deal with future pandemics. So this young person, actually he died in Prague, he died in 1918 um, of the influenza, the Spanish influenza, that's a piece of his lung. If we can identify a gene here, or two genes or three genes, which definitely correlate with the virulence potential of the 1918 virus, I think we can apply that information directly to the current situation. Today, almost a century later, there are virus strains like bird flu and swine flu. On the surface, they may seem a lot less harmful, but Oxford urges caution. What I'm saying is, bird flu hasn't killed many people yet, but it's still evolving and could perfect itself and gain the ability to jump out of Southeast Asia and begin to spread. The fact of the matter was, in that great camp at Etapla, that's the number of deaths they had there. They had about 200 deaths. But within two years, that virus had taken off. It's like an aeroplane. It had gone up to speed, taken off, and killed 80 million. That is the threat. Viruses enter our cells and start replicating using the cell's own resources. The worst ones are RNA viruses. They lack a control function and this leads to a high rate of mutation. Most mutations are not viable, but some will survive and spread. It's like Darwin. That's, that's the situation. Uh, you know, the survival of the fittest. And this virus makes sure, by throwing off all, all these mutants, that there will be one mutant that is the big boy on the block. It is the most fit virus, and it's that one which will take off. Things get worse when an RNA virus from another host animal infects us. 
different virus strains can combine and the result will be virus strains that the body's immune system is completely unfamiliar with. The HIV virus made its way to humans from monkeys a century ago. SARS and Ebola originated in bats. A virus that makes the leap from animals to humans is called a zoonosis, and virus hunters like Nathan Wolf keep discovering new ones. Sometimes pets, wild animal pets, are kept in villages, which means maybe bites, uh, children get bites, people get bites. When you hunt and butcher animals, you actually are going to have a tremendous amount of potential for contact with the full range of blood and body fluids that, that potentially could harbor these infectious diseases. Scientists at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm have access to powerful virus-spreading simulation software, and they've used this to establish how society would be able to deal with a pandemic on the order of the 1918 flu pandemic. And it's not a pretty picture. Det här scenariot då är ju en person smittad i Sydostasien som anländer till Arlanda. Då har vi när planet landar fem personer, inklusive den här första då, som är smittade. Och sen sprids smittan naturligtvis vidare över hela landet ganska så raskt. The virus spreads in homes and workplaces but mostly where people gather in large crowds. To develop and distribute a vaccine in time is impossible. Det börjar hända riktigt stora saker efter ungefär två månader. Så i vecka åtta har vi knappt 100 000 och i vecka nio 300 000. Och sen stiger det väldigt snabbt tills i princip hela populationen är berörd av det här. Antingen smittad eller, eller avlidna. The simulation provides a scary picture. Almost 7 million Swedes are infected and half a million people die. On a global scale, 70% of the world's population would become infected and 1 billion people would die. But could we get virus strains which have the potential to cause even more death and devastation or even threaten our very existence? What's to say that next time we wouldn't get something, say, with the virulence and lethality of Ebola, yet with the transmissibility of the common flu, and maybe with the incubation time of HIV-8? Um, if you did get something like that, clearly uh, the results would be very nasty indeed. A diabolical virus could spread around the world like a Trojan horse, without us even noticing it, only to wipe us out at a later date. It's an unlikely scenario, but it cannot be ruled out. You, you should never underestimate a virus, any virus. Never, ever, ever. There seems to be no in principle reason why nature could not do this. It might require some improbable combination of evolutionary events, but as an existential risk, I think it's probably as large or perhaps larger than any of the ones we've considered so far. The threat from microorganisms ranks as number six on our list. We went from tree-living monkeys to human in about six million years. Our path to this point has been lined by disasters and death. Dangerous predators, recurring droughts and ice ages reduced our numbers. But a small remnant always managed to survive and has brought us to where we are now. Considering that we have survived all the risks from nature for 100,000 years, it doesn't seem very likely that one of those would do us in within the next hundred years. And therefore, I believe that if we go extinct within the next hundred years, it is much more likely to be as a result of anthropogenic risks, risks of our own doing. <laughs> 